A heart rhythm disorder or arrhythmia is when your heart is either beating too fast or too slow. Slow heart rhythms are called bradyarrhythmias and generally they can be treated with pacemaker devices or sometimes defibrillators. Fast heart rhythm disturbances uh, can cause symptoms of palpitations, shortness of breath, lightheadedness and occasionally passing out. Uh, these arrhythmias can be treated with medications or sometimes with a, an invasive procedure called a catheter ablation. If you think about it, your heart beats 60 times uh, a minute. Um, it's, it, you re most people don't feel their heart beating. If you feel a, an unusual awareness of your heart beating, particularly if your heart is going very fast, that's something that you should talk to your physician about. Certainly if you have symptoms of lightheadedness, shortness of breath, or chest discomfort, that's something for which you should seek urgent medical attention if you have palpitations at the same time. So the vast majority of rhythm, rhythm disturbances are not life-threatening. That is particularly the case if you have otherwise a structurally normal heart, if you've never had congenital heart disease, if you've never had a heart attack, if you don't have any significant coronary artery disease, in other words, if the blood supply to your heart is normal. For people like that, symptoms of palpitations and shortness of breath associated with fast rhythm disturbances can be quite debilitating, but in the main do not put people at an increased risk of sudden death. Unfortunately, there is a subset of people who have one of those other pre-existing conditions, in other words, pre-existing heart problems, usually related to the heart muscle or the blood supply to the, to the heart. And in those people, symptoms of palpitations and fast heart rhythm disturbances can actually be a sign of a more dangerous rhythm disturbance, which should be seen, uh, for which you should be seen by your physician. When people come to see me or see one of my colleagues in the office, the first thing we do is we take a very thorough history. We will ask you about your palpitations, when they come on, if there are any obvious precipitants or triggers, what you do to abort the episodes, if they terminate spontaneously, or if you do some maneuvers to make them stop. We will also then do a physical examination, particularly listening to the heart and lungs and looking for signs of other heart disease. It's normal for our consultation for us to do an ECG to look at the electrical properties of the heart. Um, and if, if your symptoms are those of the type that come and go, in other words, paroxysmal episodes of palpitations, we oftentimes will let somebody home with a monitor. Sometimes the, they will wear the monitor for 24 hours. Sometimes I give people a monitor that they will carry around with them for six to eight weeks that they will put on if they have symptoms of palpitations. Again, the goal is to correlate the rhythm uh, at exactly the same time at the, uh, of your palpitations or your symptoms. The data is retrievable very easily by us by downloading from the device. Um, this can be done uh, over the internet or it can be done in the office. When we do that, we'll be able to uh, tell you whether or not the heart rhythm is a cause of your palpitations, uh, whether or not normal heart rhythm is the cause of the palpitations. And if so, we'll also be able to identify the particular type of heart rhythm disturbance there is because there are many different types. Once we have that information, that's invaluable. We can then guide you in terms of further diagnostic testing if necessary, but also advise you in terms of the different therapies that are available to treat these symptoms that you may have. If your symptoms come on with exercise, again, it will be important for us to try and reproduce that. So sometimes we'll send people for a treadmill test when they're hooked up to an EKG and get them exercising on a treadmill to see if we can reproduce their symptoms of palpitations. Sometimes when we do that as well, we get information as to the blood supply of the heart, which may indicate that there's some underlying coronary disease as well. The most common heart rhythm disturbance is called atrial fibrillation, and it affects more Americans than any other heart rhythm disturbance. When somebody comes into my office who has a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, um, the first thing that we do is to assess their stroke risk because people with atrial fibrillation are at an increased risk of stroke. And obviously that's the most important thing that we should address. We minimize people's risk of stroke after assessing them for other risk factors for stroke, which include underlying congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, advanced age, diabetes, or prior history of a stroke or a mini stroke, among other things. If some of these uh, coexist with atrial fibrillation, oftentimes we would recommend that the patient will be put on some form of a blood thinner, uh, like uh, warfarin, or one of the newer anticoagulant agents, which you may have heard about. Uh, once we've addressed the risk for stroke, then we have to decide if the patient is symptomatic of atrial fibrillation or not. And some people have atrial fibrillation and they don't even know they have it. And when they're back in normal rhythm, they notice no difference. However, there are uh, other types of patients, a significant proportion of patients, who complain of, of symptoms of palpitations, fatigue, lightheadedness, some, sometimes uh, chest discomfort, 
uh, when they're in atrial fibrillation. And for those people, getting the heart rhythm back to normal and not allowing them to remain in atrial fibrillation is obviously in their best interest because it's going to minimize their symptoms. Following that, if we've decided that we're going to treat uh, atrial fibrillation um, and with the hopes of maintaining a normal rhythm to minimize symptoms, uh, there are various ways that can, that can be done. Uh, most commonly worldwide, that is with medications, and there's a long list of medications which can be tried to maintain normal rhythm. Unfortunately, for some people who have atrial fibrillation, the medications don't work, and as time goes on, it can be that medications which previously worked now don't work anymore. These people and people who are highly symptomatic of atrial fibrillation would be candidates for a catheter-based approach called a catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation which involves placing uh, little hollow tubes in the veins and the groin and catheters up into the heart and targeting the areas of, H of, of the heart muscle which are responsible for the triggers or the maintenance of atrial fibrillation in that particular patient. So we know for the majority of patients who have atrial fibrillation, the disturbance starts and generally resides in the left upper chamber, the left atrium of the heart. Um, if the patient is coming for an invasive procedure, catheter ablation procedure uh, for atrial fibrillation, generally they will come in one day, have the procedure done under general anesthesia, and be discharged the following morning, all being well. The procedure uh, involves placing catheters into the left upper chamber, and we do that by accessing the veins in the groins and passing um, our catheters, or, which are little, little tubes, up into the heart, and we cross from the right side of the heart into the left side of the heart. We generally then do something called a pulmonary vein isolation procedure, which basically is to electrically disconnect, not mechanically disconnect, but electrically disconnect the veins which drain blood from the lungs into the left upper chamber of the heart, because we know that the triggers for atrial fibrillation most commonly come, come from these areas. For people who have persistent atrial fibrillation, in other words, atrial fibrillation that's present all of the time, oftentimes we have to do uh, more work than just isolating those pulmonary veins. It involves modifying the substrate, the heart muscle itself, using a, a catheter delivering radio frequency energy so that the uh, ability for the heart muscle to maintain atrial fibrillation and, and, and allowing it to persist is taken away.